Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the organizer, let me welcome you wholeheartedly to the third day of conference. The clash of culture in the European Union should we adapt or fight against that? Today, we're starting with the panel discussion about the Polish cultural resources. So, uh, does Poland have any advantages in this clash of cultures? Your guest today will be Professor David Engels. Um, from Belgium and a historian who for many years has been cooperating closely in the, the Western Institute in Poland. For many years he has been a lecturer in uh, Brussels, so you can see that not everything coming from Brussels has to be bad. We have Jacek Karnowski with us, the editor-in-chief in Wsieci, and we have Tomasz Sakiewicz with us, the editor-in-chief of Gazeta Polska. Welcome. Good morning. Okay, so you can hear us. Let's start with Professor David Engels about this uh, modern competitive advantages. Just I would just um, present the model when Poland had this uh, advantages 30 years ago. Professor Gierowski, a historian from Jagiellonian University, formulated a thesis that in the 17th century our competitive cultural edge in Poland affected our neighbors, and he described that it was not due to the politics managed by the king uh, as uh, as the culture did. So it was in the 80s and 90s in this, of the 17th century, uh, Polish was spoken in uh, Moscow. It was the lingua franca of this part of Poland. I've uh, seen a letter from uh, the uh, from the Han, who also wrote a letter in English. Miron Kosti in Bulgaria, he was a lover of Poland. He emigrated from Moldova, from Moldavia to spend the last days of his life in Poland that he loved and Hungarians um, from uh, also um, escaped Hungary um, to Poland and uh, the Prussia and the nobles and bourgeoisie uh, who wanted um, they wanted to be closer to Warsaw uh, rather than closer to Berlin and the Polish um, series Czarne Chmury tells that story so we could tell and give you more such examples the Polish uh, soldiers also spoke uh, um, Polish with a uh, prince in Dresden. So in Dresden, so that was something really powerful, and that was the culture that could mobilize societies and encourage people uh, to sympathize and to be closer to Poland. Uh, how does it look like today? Do we have any cultural model that can be attractive for uh, people outside of Poland? Uh, I think that the best person to present it, it will be David Engels. Yes, first, thank you. Thank you very much for, for the invitation. I'm really happy to, to be here and to, to speak about this, uh, this, this, this very important uh, subject. Please permit me also to present my text by reading because that, that makes it a bit easier for, for the translators than, than just um, improvising it. So uh, at first, 
Poland situation may seem very bleak indeed. In, in most Western media, Poland is presented as a rogue state on the same footing as Iran, Russia, China, or perhaps even North Korea. Poland, so they claim, has become a clerical fascist dictatorship where Muslims and gay people are persecuted, where all media just repeat government propaganda, where the opposition has been muted, and where the justice has lost its independence. Furthermore, most citizens in Western Europe still honestly think uh, Poland is a grey, rundown, post-communist wasteland, an uncivilized terra incognita populated by lorry drivers and criminals, and where the only attractions of any interest are German concentration camps. Given popular opinion, it is no wonder the European Union can get away with actively trying to blackmail and bullying the Polish population into operating a regime change. The German media not only deplore Poland's alleged total disregard for democracy and human rights, but also claim Poland's refusal to obey Brussels and Luxembourg is a danger for the existence of Europe itself and must thus be punished by all means, even total financial starvation. Unfortunately, though not unexpectedly, under the new Biden administration, the US, Poland's traditional support, are also firmly condemning the Polish government and disinvest Eastern Central Europe in order to fully focus on China. And all the while, Germany and Russia, once again, seem to construe new agreements behind Poland's back and not only bypass Eastern Central Europe when it comes to bringing Russian gas to Germany, but they also work very successfully in presenting Poland as the eternal enemy of peace in Europe. Finally, the lockdown imposed by the COVID pandemic has also taken a high economic toll and the helps withheld by the EU are like a knife stabbed into the back of the Polish economy. And yet, though we have to look reality in the eyes without false illusions, we should not be too pessimistic, as Poland also possesses many advantages most Western European countries have lost, and which may enable her to survive the coming difficult years. First, Poland has such a long and traumatic history of political betrayal by her partners and of political partition that a significant part of the nation has become highly suspicious of any endeavors to limit Polish freedom in the name of a greater good, even the so-called European values. This distrust is a considerable strength which uh, other nations, mostly in Western Europe, seem to have lost where the deconstruction of cultural identity through multiculturalism and historical guilt is already so far progressed that there is not much resistance against the growing decline of democracy as people just retire into their personal life and leave the political stage to the new elites. This leads to another important point, the cultural homogeneity of the Polish people. Of course, this homogeneity is a somewhat artificial result of the horrible reshaping of the political and ethnic borders during and after the Second World War and somewhat collides with Poland's age-old experiences of organizing a multi-ethnic and multi-religious empire. However, in the current situation, the astonishing linguistic, cultural and religious homogeneity of the Polish people combined with a strong tradition of small and medium entrepreneurship and an overall love for one's own country and tradition has formed an exceptionally resilient population. Indeed, without a strong common identity, there can be no feeling of solidarity between citizens in times of crisis, and it is obvious that such times of crisis are approaching fast. Another asset is Poland's booming economy. The growth rates of the Polish economy, together with the high professional skills of the Poles themselves, make the country an ideal place to invest, and together with its cultural and political stability, it is to be expected that Poland may survive the upcoming economic crisis much better than other European nations and gradually become a crucial industrial and technological motor of the continent. Indeed, while the southern European nations are in a deep recession due not the least to the mismanagement of the common European currency, and while even France is threatening to experience a serious financial crisis during the coming years, Poland, 
together with its other Eastern Central European neighbors, is surprisingly stable and also enjoys the advantage of, reming, of remaining independent from the Euro system. Finally, let us not forget about the spiritual assets of Poland. While the rest of Europe has long since willfully rejected its Christian roots, Poland still remains strongly characterized by her commitment to Christianity. And though it is undeniable that many young people start to adopt a more materialistic and atheist way of life, the church still plays an important role in the construction of the Polish mindset and, most of all, its morality. Thus, while the West has lost its faith and, with it, the belief in its own destiny and divine protection, many Poles still consider that political action must evolve within a framework defined by Christian transcendence and Christian tradition. This is a precious rampart in the fight against Western relativism and positivism, where values are the mere result of political majorities and can lead, sooner or later, to moral abominations. And, of course, Poland is not alone. On the one hand, the alliance with Hungary and the other Visegrad nations has been for many years a most useful counterbalance against the Axis Paris-Berlin and will hopefully become the nucleus of an ever stronger cooperation between the nations of the Intermarium area with its many common interests and shared identity. On the other hand, Poland is enjoying gradual support by many citizens and conservative opposition parties in Western Europe and might be able, should the political situation in France or Italy turn, to build up reliable and like-minded alliances which may also help to counterbalance the growing threats from Brussels or from Washington. Of course, all these features have to be interpreted in their broader political context. It is obvious that should the current state of affairs be prolonged for many years, the Polish population will not be able to resist the political, economic and cultural pressure from the West and sooner or later will be bullied into electing a government which would be a mere puppet of the elites governing Berlin and Brussels. But it is highly unlikely that the current system will remain unchanged and unchallenged to the contrary, it is to be expected that the West will gradually tumble into a deep and complex crisis that will make European politics unpredictable, even violent. But a low independent player, some margins of action they might not have under more stable circumstances. Thus, the European economy is at the brink of disaster and transformation into a planned economy. The middle class is disappearing while social polarization is growing Multiculturalism has failed and is replaced by the paradigm of the clash of civilizations. More and more citizens disinvest the political system and join numerous resistance movements. The temptation of censorship and surveillance is transforming liberalism into authoritarianism and the rise of China will soon end the Western global hegemony. But while Western Europe will soon be transformed into the battleground of the many conflicts and contradictions created by its own political mistakes, the East, above all Poland, may remain quite unscathed if it managed to defend its identity and autonomy long enough. In practice, this means fortifying a conservative hold over the democratic structures, building up a strong presence in media, schools and academia, making the economic system as resilient and independent from the West as possible, diversifying extra-European alliances, resisting Brussels interferences as much as possible, building up strong regional cooperation with the Intermarium states and sponsoring like-minded Western European political parties and media. Only then can Poland and Eastern Central Europe be ready once the painful self-destruction of Western Europe enters its hot phase and become not only a beacon of stability, democracy and tradition during these years, but also the starting point for a new alternative European cooperation. Thank you very much. So there is a lot of hope in what you've said that maybe this weakness uh, 
is uh, not that we are not so vulnerable as we could think. So we might say that um, as Poland uh, in history attracted Muslims, now it attracts conservatives. They can settle here uh, far from the leftist madness. So you, dear professor, you're a good example of that. And now I'd like to ask a question to Tomasz Sakiewicz, as we might say that thanks to the collapse of Gazeta Polska, the editor Sakiewicz has some wide intelligence covering uh, different countries. So um, how? what are your conclusions? What are the competitive advantages of Poland now uh, in modern times for in 2021 to convince the Western societies that we are not, as Professor Engels said, a uh, uh, terra uh, incognita full of criminals uh, at uh, the Vistula Re River? Thank you very much for this question. I've just uh, went back from uh, I'm just back uh, from one meeting of club in Płock, bringing together hundreds of uh, people. But we have about 500 such clubs in Australia, Lithuania, Poland, of course, as well, the Western Europe and uh, the Western uh, coast of um, the US. So as to San Diego, so uh, the empire of um, rising sun. But when I'm asked by clubbers from the Western countries about Poland, the first question is how much is an apartment in Poland? And it's not a random question. A lot of people who left Poland, these are people from Solidarity um, Movement. They think about coming back to Poland not because they long Poland, but it's so different uh, in terms of culture, and it's more familiar to them in terms of uh, culture and economic conditions. So uh, we uh, still have uh, prices which are get, get closer and closer to the Western prices, but they're still lower. So that attracts some uh, minor investors and uh, employees from other countries. So the direction of migration has changed a bit. So Poles stop uh, leaving Poland for the Western countries. We have more and more employees from Italy, from Spain, Port Portugal, Greece, and other countries which were affected by uh, two last European crisis. And I think that this direction will go even deeper and it will develop. The matter of cultural difference is not as important as economic issues. But in private talks, uh, they uh, support Poland. And they support Poland in this war that we have against Berlin and Brussels. Quite recently, I've been uh, talking to uh, trade union uh, to, to a head of uh, trade union in Italy, and what he was really astonished that we speak the very same language, we have the very same problems as he defines. So he f told he's a bit lonely in the definition of their country and the European relations. And, but it appeared that we had about 90% of the same topics that bothered us. So the political correctness caused that people thinking alike couldn't reach one another with information. And now going back to the main topic of our uh, discussion about cultural advantages, we would have to think about the sources of the Polish uh, culture uh, itself and its power, which is enormous. Very often it is defined by a small fraction of uh, history, by some events, and it was a long-term uh, process, uh, in fact, that we call the First Republic of Poland. And that created some kind of culture, which is very characteristic for two countries existing in uh, globally. The first one, it was the Republic of Poland, which collapsed, but the cultural uh, history and identity stood with us. And the another one is the United States. So these cultures are quite similar when it comes to organization and the way uh, we think about society. So a great dynamics of re rebound. So um, in Byzantium and in the Roman culture, everyone, after the collapse, after the fall of the empire, everyone wanted to see uh, the rebirth of the Eastern or Western Roman Empire. And the Republic of Poland didn't have uh, such idea, but they recreated both uh, Roman empires. Um, so uh, that um, 
at some point, uh, Poland uh, gathered and all um, Orthodox Church uh, centers were located in Poland. Then Constantinople collapsed and the Balkans, which were mostly uh, Orthodox and they were invaded by the Turks and the traditions from uh, Russia could continue only within the First Republic of Poland. For that reason, we had some rebirth of culture that was unprecedented and unseen in other countries because I, either they were affected by Byzantine tradition or by Western uh, Rome tradition. For example, um, traditional outfit of a noble, Polish nobles, it was uh, very characteristic. And when it comes to human rights, to democracy, uh, to write some kind of rule of law that you cannot convict anyone without being judged, the, uh, the federation, the uh, election of kings, uh, the similar system was adopted by the Americans because today, uh, American system was previously known in Poland and was initiated in Poland. So this is something that entered our uh, consciousness, but also the consciousnesses of other uh, countries. So that was a counter proposal to the empire. There was the Republic versus the empire, like in the Star Wars. So the dispute in this part of region is underway f since uh, many centuries we decided to live uh, in Republican tradition, but there is a lot of a lot more traditions inside. Of course, we have respect for democracy, we have respect for uh, human rights and for freedom. There is no Republican tradition. It it starts with the the will to be a free man. So we got to this critical point in this war of culture because our freedom starts to be limited. And our greatest advantage here over the attack from Brussels or Berlin these are not economic issues. Because we uh, could strike some balance here and even win, but this is about the limitation of freedom that, uh, that's that been with us uh, since the Second World War. Let's have a look at Ukraine and Russia, a similar language, similar, similar religion and similar customs. But what is the difference between Ukrainians and Russians? Why the Ukrainians want to join the European Union, uh, although they they are part of a different tradition, and Russia likes uh, the situation as it is. Because uh, during the, f the times of the First Republic of Poland, we implanted the will to be free people in them. So they are hungry for freedom. This is the most important. This is something which is also very characteristic of Polish people. Uh, the Poles uh, had elections. And the Ukrainians had the Maiden. And these traditions were transferred as part of our pride and our main value that we decide uh, about our fate, about our government and our state. And if somebody tries to steal it uh, from us, that raises some objection. And not all Europeans are aware of that, that we are not fighting for for same-sex marriages rights or the construction of our judicial system. But it's about deciding about ourselves, so the fundamental right who decides. And the moment when this consciousness uh, emerges. This is a critical point in this war because it is very difficult to tame it because you cannot tame somebody's freedom. So there is no other advantage rather than being self-defining our identity. Of course, we can see this idea also in these because, of course, Ukrainians want to follow our path. Lukashenko fights against us because he thinks that we implanted our revolution in Belarus. The problem is that uh, the um, Belarusians 
didn't have to get anything. They just fell in love of what they could see in Poland. We are quite dangerous for governors, for heads of states in the East, because we uh, are a role model. We give them the idea how you can uh, live in a wealthy state, not to listen to anyone from abroad. And that this example will be really powerful abroad. Maybe for some nations it's more difficult to understand because they didn't have to pay such a high price. But I think that the time will come soon when this mutiny, mutiny to to sell, to decide about yourselves, will invade also the Western countries, and it was, it's going to be as an infectious disease. You can we can see some grassroots initiatives, a lot of social. Um, officers does it but it is um, now it is not explicit yet so on one hand these are imperial interest of berlin who have nothing to do with the cultural war berlin doesn't fight for this or that um, civilization they just want to dominate in terms of economy and business but of course there is this cultural war managed by the marxist which is applied by the germans by berlin and neo-Marxists are very useful idiots, as Lenin used to call them. And they are used by Berlin to fight with inconvenient countries that enter into the realm of German's interests. German, German. Yes, but this alliance is quite weak and it can uh, backfire in Berlin. Sooner or later, Berlin will have to define themselves through how they organize their own state. I'm quite calm when it comes to the results, the outcomes of this war, because the Germans, I agree with Professor Engels, that the Germans will get weaker and weaker in comparison to other states. There are some out of European powers, and the Germans' domination is not um, favored by uh, also by non-European states, and the power of Germany maybe it's not higher but it's not uh, weaker for, in comparison to other countries. So, so this proportion will change um, gradually when it comes to the war. I have some question marks because we have uh, sad symptoms as before the fall of the Roman Empire so uh, the uh, collapse and the crisis of faith uh, of patriotism and uh, weakening of money because we have to remember that uh, before the fall of the Roman Empire, uh, there uh, has there was a great inflation because they couldn't finance the country that uh, because the citizens didn't want to defend their country on their own. They had to pay for that. And on the other hand, this crisis will also uh, have some symptoms of rebound. It's not like that the Christianity will, rebirth, will be reborn in Europe, but Europe has a power of pragmatism, a strong neo-Marxist revolution that has invaded universities and members of academia. It will be replaced with the need to live how we want it. That can be convenient for Poland because Poland will uh, say that we will live this or that way and you can do whatever you want. And this is the ultimate stage of this revolution. It will just get diluted in the needs uh, of countries, of different business centers, uh, because it's, it's ultimately it will be inconvenient for them. These Polish-American relations interestingly translate into the sources of of American independence in the form of um, its fathers, but also the Constitution uh, has its sources in uh, um, the work of Senator Doskonałym of uh, the perfect senator by Gościcki. The Poloniusz is the Republican, the um, intrigue monger who inspires um, for uh, uh, Disagreement. Now let me ask Jacek Karnowski. Is Poland still like presented in these beautiful pictures on your of your four speakers? Maybe that Poland is not there already. Authors said before the war that the, the beautiful Poland is not there anymore. Sir Hipoche, not a national, but a um, um, a Ukrainian. Um, 
Patriot says that Ukraine took over the burden uh, of fighting against this Eastern invasion. And the essay of uh, the spirit of Poland, the question is raised of this continuity being broken and certainly certain codes are um, still there they are being continued and the uh, polish capacity to uh, generate new elites this is there and uh, solidarity demonstrated that when in the new group of people these wonderful leaders were um, uh, chosen one thing has to be said, that is, Poland is a very important place. A lot is being decided in Poland, and uh, that is uh, a sure thing. And Poland is always between uh, being great and being nothing. Our cultural resources are such that either we reach certain power or we're going to be um, pushed into the abyss. Poland and Germany, I th uh, sorry, uh, Polish and Hungary, I think it is uh, no wonder and no coincidence that these two countries oppose the model proposed by Berlin um, as a model for Europe. These are historical countries with their high culture, with their history, um, millennial history. Um, countries that have had periods of uh, greatness, they have had imperial experience. They know what it means to lose and be enslaved. So it's no coincidence. Looking at Slovakia, with all due respect for uh, this beautiful country, it is the Slovak region, it's a region, it has always been part of an empire, and it always saw itself as a of being having a regional character, of course, having autonomous privileges, a certain autonomy, but their um, state-wise aspirations for Slovaks um, was not something typical of this culture. It was uh, always, they were always under the influence of the Turks or other empires. So that perspective is different, and I think this is um, a section where Hungary and Poland stand out. I'm wondering uh, whether a thesis, the following thesis, might be uh, risked. This um, liberalism, cultural liberalism, can only be opposed totally. You cannot be opposed a little bit, or you will be crushed. Um, in that case, if you decide to oppose it totally, you will reach 30, 40 percent of votes in an election. And if you stop at that, then you will probably be destroyed by non-governmental organizations that are indeed political organizations. And if you go to war against them, because you have to, because you're under attack, then they will straight away make you, um, you know, give you the face of a, a tyrant. Fidesz is um, a party that uh, has to NATO siły, prawda? Śmierć Jan Szyzmowi. So, when such a party wins, takes uh, over uh, the power, uh, then uh, you know you're going to be attacked by the left. This shows how false these images are. When you get a piece of power, you will straight away be attacked with knives and clubs and you will be portrayed as a tyrant straight away. But I think we should be frank with ourselves. It's not that Polish culture is particularly strong today. Just look at what happens to Poles in the West, in the UK, in Ireland. Some stick with their Polish character. They are seen as uh, 
easy material for assimilation mostly though most run away from their uh, Polish character seeing the local culture as more attractive and giving a better perspective what happens to people who come from strong cultural regions from Podlasie to coming to Warsaw they become left leaning straight away not in all cases but very often Polish elites often raise their children for emigration for they are prepared being prepared from childhood um, to study at foreign universities this is a way to raise managers of multinational corporations is sending your child to a foreign university a way to promote the Polish interest, to raise the Polish elite? No, it is not. We climb the social ladder to send our children uh, overseas instead of in order to raise Polish elites here. The church is under attack in Poland much more than in other Catholic countries like in Slovakia. This ability among Catholics to self-defend is limited. Many Poles easily drop their relations with the church, which is at the same time a relation with um, Rome, with Byzantium, with 2,000 years of history. Mr. Glinski is under attack for not doing this or that. There's really nobody to talk about in those in, uh, in those circles. There's no way to find a consensus. Everybody does what they want, and nobody looks at the interest of uh, the Republic of Poland. At the end of the day, you know, everybody is trying to make sure that nothing succeeds at the Polish front and those forces that defend civilization and the Polish culture were most successful in the 90s and that most energetic um, generation of authors journalists who were our role models they are of course active but generally the creative force that impact took place at a time where when the right was not in power so I think that energy was partially lost but uh, to finish off on a more positive note I'd like to pick up on what Mr. Sakevich said that is this love of freedom this is something that blocks uh, possible success of political correctness and which is a huge potential uh, capital for the future and which makes it's difficult to govern. Mm, this is because they at the same time would like to be in power, but at the same time in opposition. It's a misunderstanding on the right. And a counter elite is here, and it's here since the communist times. It was there during the during communism as well. You, we do not realize to what extent there is absolutely no debate. To what extent any debate is absolutely dead in the West. I think most Poles do not realize to what extent um, the discourse is monopolized in the West. Every think tank, portal, institution, this kind of conference organized for us for the second time by Patrick, yeah, Patrick Yaki, Project Poland. These are wonderful, invaluable things, and this should be cared for. We are courageous, and uh, the sentence of the Court of Just no, of the Constitutional Court. Why did it raise uh, so much protest? Well, because it struck a nerve in Europe, and it showed that somewhere out there in Poland might be a long, strong stream that is uh, still there. It uh, might be half dormant, but in France uh, it uh, was very obvious, and they were afraid that uh, Poland might be the spark 
remember that if we take public opinion polls, 51% polls uh, want to vote for right-wing parties if we include cookies, confederacy, and law and justice. And that's valuable. Generally, I believe that we should be realistic in understanding our advantages and disadvantages and to what um, Primate Vyshinsky was doing in the 50s, that is, pose uh, opposition uh, where possible in the hope that God will not abandon us and we will see change. Where could Vyshinsky see hope in the 1950s? Communism was prevailing everywhere, also in the West. And yet he was wise, flexible in what he was doing, although he um, was accused of going for compromise with communists. And yet he was the one that led the church to a breakthrough. And I think that's the way to go. Look for such paths, hoping for some change that might come from a direction where we do not expect it to come from. And that's very often what happens. Change comes from a direction we were not looking towards. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you for your lecture. I just wanted to say that if all politicians were so clear in saying what we should be doing, we would be in a completely different place now. Thank you. Well, with these um, three distinguished panelists, it's so difficult to ask questions. I think the professor is um, uh, not used to being asked questions, maybe. But I'd like you gentlemen to, um, to quote examples. Because we're talking of a culture code of love of freedom. Sure, this is a source of uh, cultural um, advantage, but we need specific tools. Jacek Karnowski said that um, film is not a tool because the director will always try to suck up to the elite uh, at the end of the day. Like um, in the case of the film about Ziegel Boim, who talked about the huge um, support of Poles for Jews during the occupation. So what could be such tools, universities, art elites, maybe other kind of elites, or the cult of Zhonieza um, Wyklenci was this motive that strengthened patriotic uh, circles very strongly in the past. So what could be such an instrument of a um, advantage of Poland, culturally wise, Professor? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. So if, if, I'm not sure if I, if I got the, the, the translation, but w w what would be uh, important instruments and tools in order to... to mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's what I. Uh, well, I, th I think one important asset that, that Poland doesn't really realize it have is that there might be quite a lot of sympathies for Poland in Western Europe, uh, but Poland doesn't really sell itself very very efficiently. So uh, I mean, if you if you look at uh, everything that has to do with uh, political education, with re-information, re uh, with uh, uh, um, teaching or, or explaining uh, to people uh, what is really happening in Poland, what are the values that are at stance. Unfortunately, Poland really doesn't manage to, to, to transfer this information as good as it might possible. And that is why we have, of course, this enormous influence of Russia today, on the, on the one hand, whereas the Pol Polish media are in, in, in a large part absent. And I think that would really be important to launch a, 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 a media campaign and trying to show uh, through media outlets in France, in Germany, in, in the UK, in Italy, uh, what the Polish point of view is. And I think there is an enormous need of the people in France or in Germany to, to know about reality, not only about what is happening in Poland, but also in their own country, and to have this, this alternative view. And I think that is something really important uh, that, uh, that Poland could do. Another thing is, of course, uh, only, uh, also becoming a hub of uh, um, alternative academic uh, formation, of elite formation. I think uh, um, Poland uh, and Hungary are already trying 
uh, through the Collegium Intermarium or the MCC in Budapest to launch such, such an initiative, but it would really important to, 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 uh, um, to, to draw uh, conservative elites from Western Europe to Poland in order to, to give them an, uh, a decent formation uh, uh, and then to send them back to their own home countries with all the sympathy also for Poland they might gain also while being here. There are already initiatives like that, but I think they really need to be pushed because time is, time is running away. So it's, it's really now that we need to do all this media and uh, academic uh, alternatives. Czas nas goni, ale skoro media zostały wywołane do tablicy, że media... Time is running out, but since the media have been mentioned in communication with the West, let me ask Jacek Karnowski about such tools of Polish cultural advantages. Well, indeed, these initiatives of communication with the West tend to be ambitious, but don't change much, and they're not really breakthrough. Let me quote Professor Legutko once again. He once said in the Western press that there is a single journalist with a thousand names that was during the communist times. So it's important to uh, understand that these institutions and uh, media are very strongly controlled. I think that we are going through a, a test, a burden test, because we are the country that has taken uh, on the burden of organizing the region of the three seas. We are on the front line in uh, opposing the reduction of the status of certain countries to the role of autonomies. So I think this is a prestigious, um, I mean, um, a, 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 um, a dip in prestige. But if we can continue on this road and if we continue to accumulate wealth and we keep our identity at the same time, I think we can go really high. But we need to uh, pass successfully this burden test. So by way of uh, summarizing, Tomasz Sakiewicz, please. Well, I agree with what Professor Engel said and with what Jacek Karnowski said. I agree that what's very important is a narrative in communication with the West. We need to make them understand our message. In spite of the huge criticism of um, the part of Berlin, Paris, and several other capitals at the level of uh, the governing party, because at the level of uh, opposition it was different, I'm talking about the uh, court, um, uh, the uh, constitutional court ruling. Well, things were defined at the level they are at, in fact, because is the Constitution more important or European uh, acts of law? Well, it's obvious that the Constitution is of uh, uh, higher range due to the fact that it's the expression of the will of uh, the people. And this uh, defining this narration, being defined in a particular way, had a very strong was a very strong message because we said straight, uh, straightforward what we want, uh, what we believed. And as you know, we have an English channel which is um, broadcast to, to the US and to the West um, for a few hours per day. But we unfortunately have no resources to build other media at a large scale. Unfortunately, I have to interrupt you because we have no more time. It's very easy to, it's much easier to have uh, cooperation, understanding with local media, local journalists, but that takes time. The West is so strong in this culture war. We uh, might. Uh, um, quote Karol Hotkiewicz before the war in Kirholm, where everybody was panicking and everybody was 
say, saying, how many are there, these Swedes, and so on. And he said, take it easy. We'll count them once we beat them. And this is what I wish for you. My guests have been David Engels, uh, Jacek Karnowski, and Tomasz Sakiewicz. Thank you very much.